and then saying like, oh, I guess you're not having any. So we wink out.
Um, I've always fancied myself something of an artist. I started drawing when I was a little kid, and I even got pretty good at it at one point in my adolescence. Um, I've worked with a variety of visual media, including drawing, painting, photography, and I wrote music from about 1993 through about 2001. Uh, a couple of years ago, I just started to I uh, decided to start painting again, um, and I brought a few paintings that I did recently. They're up here if you want to take a look at them after or whenever. Um, so throughout history, there have certainly been free, uh, free thinking artists, and in the past century, of course, we've seen that number greatly increase. Uh, the artistic personality tends to challenge conventional wisdom and thinking anyway. Uh, most artists take pride in challenging their, art, their audiences in one way or another. Um, in classical art, however, money was the motiv motivating factor, and the entities that had money to spend on art were the government, the aristocracy, and the church. So for that reason, most of the you know, great art from the past was religious in nature, or you know, portraits of kings and uh, royalty. Um, so the artists were commissioned to create those uh, <coughs> artworks, so they had to you know, fall within certain guidelines to uh, make their handlers happy. Um, some artists, though, were brazen enough to include little barbs and uh, criticisms of the very person who is funding their art. Um, it's been a while since I took art history class, but if you, you know, go research uh, a lot of the great artists, you'll find that they you know, did sneak in little uh, things here and there. Um, uh, especially Mozart is a good example of that. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Amadeus, he uh, liked to have fun. And of course that movie is not entirely historically accurate, but it is a, uh, um, there is a lot of uh, truth in there as to his personality. Um, so yeah, the creative personality, um, it's a, uh, can be a rather uh, fascinating, uh, Okay, so moving through time, over the past hundred years, thanks in large part to the Industrial Revolution, the progress in technology, we've seen a great population growth, and with that came a large shift in who was the consumer and of art. And it went from being something funded by, you know, the rich to something that, you know, any, uh, just the layman had access to. Um, so with that shift, artists were be, became able to more freely express themselves as they wanted. They could, you know, just do what they wanted to do, and it would find an audience um, who was willing to pay money for it. Uh, we see this especially in music, which uh, went from symphonies, operas, choral music, to popular music. Um, and even within pop music, uh, we see constant revolution and change. Um, genres that used to be, you know, subversive and um, edgy are now, like we look back at those and think, Wow, that's really tame. I can't believe anyone was offended by that. Um, like when Elvis uh, came out, he was, you know, the downfall of Western civilization. He's going to destroy America with his swiveling hips. And now if you look at his music, you're like, okay, he was singing about love, and yeah, that's it's pretty non threatening. Um, Okay, so fast forward a little to 1994, when my, one of my favorite atheist compos composers, Mr. Trent Reznor, uh, sang in his Nine Inch Nails song entitled Heresy. He sewed his eyes shut because he is afraid to see. He tries to tell me what I put inside of me. 
He's got the answers to ease my curiosity. He dreamed a god up and called it Christianity. He flexed his muscles to keep his flock of sheep in line. He made a virus that would kill off all the swine. His perfect kingdom of killing, suffering, and pain demands devotion, atrocities done in his name. Your god is dead and no one cares. If there is a hell, I'll see you there. <laughs> So yeah, the, uh, the shift in art, you know, came rather quickly in the past hundred years. Um, so how does it incorporate into your life? And uh, what can art do for you? Uh, when I took painting back up uh, a few years ago, I was remind reminded how rewarding creativity can be. Um, for those of you who are my friends on Facebook, you know how, uh, how much I just love my job. <laughs> and uh, basically, it's the same thing every day. I, you know, am basically just a drone. I review numbers, and uh, yeah, it's it's very repetitive and droning. And uh, having a creative outlet is very uh, refreshing and um, enlightening because you use your mind in such a different way that it, uh, you know, provides you uh, mental exercise as well as uh, diversity. So I challenge everyone to try something creative. Now, not everyone has artistic talent, but there are lots of things you can do that are creative that don't involve, you know, painting or uh, that, like you can write something, um, you can take improv classes, you can take dance classes, just try something new and different that's going to cause you to have to create something. And uh, even if you think you're not artistic, go ahead and try something. Um, like for these paintings, I went to Home Depot, I bought uh, scrap lumber and return paint, you know, on the, <laughs> the yeah, the yeah, the 50 cent paint, and that's what I did with it. And I, you know, just tried stuff with brushes, with, you know, <coughs> uh, media, and um, you never know what you do, you, you're capable of until you try it. So I, again, challenge everyone to just try something outside their comfort zone and something creative, uh, whatever that uh, may be, and see what new things you can do. And, uh, of course, it's part of the uh, scientist in me that says there's also been studies there's also been studies that have shown that creative pursuits like writing and painting, particularly visually creative pursuits, can actually um, have the same effect as serotonin reuptake inhibitors, those are antidepressant drugs, um, in the brain. And so it can actually make you feel better um, to kind of exercise those creative muscles. So, okay. I have one more, um, and this one's a much shorter Tim mentioned clip that I'd like to play for you guys if you'll cooperate. Anyone. And for those of you who are new to Tim Minchin, he does have a very extensive YouTube channel and you can go and see all of his uh, very entertaining and somewhat good um, videos. Uh, I try to keep this as Alright, All right. and up next we have Catherine Galvan who's going to share us some, with us some poetry. <laughs> he actually came to the Church of Christ to give a sermon. 
and mom looked at him, listened to him, and told the person that day, I'm marrying that man. <laughs> of course, she didn't know he was Baptist yet. So, he wasn't well educated. He uh, dropped out of school like a lot of young boys. As soon as uh, he heard about Pearl Harbor, he was in line to sign up for the war. My dad, since he was stationed in the Philippines and fought in several battles out there, he understood the meaning of liberty, freedom, and peace better than I do, better than probably most of you ever know. Uh, here is the poem he wrote to my mother while he was stationed out there, lonely and very in love. Light me a candle. Light me a candle, darling, and keep it burning brightly as I love. No matter how thick your curtain, and complete your blanket, I shall see it from afar. Sleep long, sleep tired, and dream while I am gone of happiness past and yet to be. From this our guiding star, when this crazy, bloody, crazed interlude is done, and we are free to live and to love and live. Zachary Moore to talk about our elections for this year. Oh, sorry. It's just about that time again to, to talk about elections. Um, many of us feel like well, we've gotten all the presidential election season behind us. Um, but we have, here at the Fellows for Free Thought, we are a uh, membership organization um, and uh, we, are, we operate democratically. So we have regular annual elections. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that process. Here because we're sort of right in the thick of, of that. So, uh, for those of you that don't know, this all this does not come about spontaneously, right? So, all of the stuff that uh, all the organization and all of the uh, all the things that are done by this organization, for the most part, are orchestrated by the board of directors. So, who are the board of directors? Quick answer: Well, the people that show up at the board meetings, for the most part, <laughs> and you know the board meetings. You know, more like board meetings, <laughs> right? Um, so I don't know, seriously, the, the, the people who are the board of directors are the people that are in charge of helping this community to grow. And you can sort of think of it, you know, I, I kind of like the, the garden, you know, reference. Where, you know, a lot of the stuff, all this free thought stuff, you know, this does happen spontaneously in, in, in some respect. You know, sort of like how, you know, wildflowers grow spontaneously. And, and you know, wildflowers are beautiful. And, and free thought is beautiful when it just happens spontaneously and, and different people you know, sort of come, come to it and, and do, do things on their own. And that's great. But, you know, gardens are also quite pretty too. And if you've ever been into a garden that's really well maintained, it can really be breathtaking. Um, you know, just how everything is sort of um, put together and, you know, you can tell that a lot of thought is put into, you know, what colors are chosen for this area and which flowers go here and there. So, you know, you can sort of think of this, what we're doing here, as a free thought garden. And so the board of directors are basically the gardeners, are the ones in charge of uh, making sure the seeds are planted at the right time, making sure the weeds get, get pulled, and uh, making sure everything is watered regularly. So, I'd like to take just a few minutes and just explain to you a little bit about who um, the specific, uh, or what the specific positions are, and who occupies them now in the current board. Um, and so all this, uh, this uh, information here comes right from our bylaws uh, that were put in place uh, right pretty much after we were founded and were approved by the membership at the time. So the executive director is the person who, according to the bylaws, provides oversight for the board and ensures that the mission of the FOF is being met and is also the primary public interface of the organization. Now what does that really mean? Translation, make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And also, generally gets interviewed by the newspaper when things come up. So that's that's pretty much what the executive does. Um, at the moment, our current director is the intrepid, the amazing Alex Jules, uh, who unfortunately um, is uh, is, you can, is spreading all the good cheer that you can see reflected from that photo um, down in Houston right now. Uh, he was actually in, invited uh, to speak at the Houston Oasis, which is um, it's an organization very much similar to what we have here, in fact. So he's giving this talk right now, of course, and otherwise he would be doing this, and not me. So you can blame him for the inferior presentation. Um, 
The next uh, key position that we have on the board of directors is the education director. This person provides direction and organization for the educational development of the membership. Translation, make sure this gathering happens, and make sure it's planned properly, finds lectures um, that are out there in the community to promote, finds smart people to talk to us here. And this is currently Jamie Carr that has put all this together today. Um, the social director uh, is another key position. The social director plans and organizes events uh, for the FOF to meet the social desires of the membership. Translation, make sure there's lots of fun stuff on the calendar, and also finds, and, you know, this is very important, finds people to host events for us, because one person can't do it all. Um, at, at the moment, our director is Whitney Ford. Whitney will be stepping down. Um, she's, obviously, if you've seen her here, <coughs> pregnant like crazy, and so she's going to have a, a, lot of, a lot of other stuff to, uh, to deal with very soon. Aren't those synonymous? <laughs> Pregnant things. I don't want to say it. I'll let you say it. <laughs> uh, our outreach director. Outreach is something that's also very important to us and makes us a little bit different from some of the other free thought organizations in the area. Uh, our outreach director plans and organizes voluntary service activities, including working with other service organizations. Translation finds ways to help us give back. So, uh, organizes the, the event like what happened last night, the big cocktail party. Um, which I'm surprised anybody made it in from that. I saw some of the photos that looked pretty crazy. Um, raised, I don't want to steal everybody's thunder, but raised a hell of a lot of money also for the foundation, I believe. Um, and also collecting clothes for the needy, uh, food drives, uh, organizes the, uh, the highway pickup, the uh, lakeshore cleanup, all those really great things that we do in the community. That's the responsibility of the outreach director to make sure that all happens. And currently that is Melanie Clement. Uh, and also the youth, right? So one of the things that, that we try to do um, that some other organizations don't focus on is make sure there's activities for kids, right? So the youth director represents the youth of the FOF, including planning youth-specific activities, not just here at the gathering, but elsewhere, and working with other directors as needed. Translation finds great teachers and finds great events for our kids. Right? And this is absolutely critical because it's it's not just about us, it's about the next generation. If we cannot, and believe me, the churches know this too. The churches know this all too well. Um, and if they can find, and I, I'll tell you, I, uh, I was at, I won't say which church last week, but I was at a pretty big church not too far from here, less than a mile from here. And they had really fun activities for the kids. When the kids walked into their area, they were handed donuts. They were ushered into a room that had ping pong tables, and foosball, and air hockey, and video games. Right? All the Jesus stuff came afterwards, obviously, but that's, I'll tell you, that's what gets them there every Sunday morning. So I'm not saying that we need to do that, but that's our competition. And currently, uh, our director, our youth director is Amanda Jules, who's been in that role for uh, many years, actually since we started. And the final named position on the board of directors is our finance director. This person is responsible for the financial oversight of the FO, including accounting, budgeting, and fundraising. This is not the director, this is an, or not, not the uh, treasurer, this is an oversight position on the board. Um, translation, so show me the money, what's happening with the money. Um, and currently that is Justin Fisher. Uh, in addition to those named positions, our board has up to six additional positions call those alloys directors or directors at large. And these are up to six additional people who represent the interests of the, the FOF membership when we hold board meetings. Translation, these are just people that we ask to make their opinion known. And currently we have six of those, Don Llewellyn, Howard Harkness, myself, Ann, Jeff, and the other Don. Sorry, Don, but you're the other Don. <laughs> when, yeah, once you yeah, well, once you get a little bit wider, then we'll have another. Yeah. We'll reassess. Uh, but but so these people show up at our board meetings and you know basically help make the, make the decisions uh, on behalf of the membership. So these are also very important. and they can also take on other roles and responsibilities, um, sort of at an ad hoc basis. But there's no specific role for them as there are for the other name positions. So our election process. How does this work? Well, right now we're using, uh, we're, we're in the current board that I've just described. Starting in January, uh, we organize a nomination committee. 
and I'm actually chair of it this year, the nomination committee thinks about people that might be good um, fits for the board in the next term, right? People that have shown either interest or aptitude or we think might be good for a certain role and start putting those lists together, reaching out to those people, find out if they're interested and willing. Um, in February, uh, that committee makes its report to the board and in March, uh, we actually collect ballot petitions and I'll tell you about those right now. So, the board, as I said, forms a committee uh, to nominate people and does approve that, that list. But that is not the end of it, because again, this is a membership organization, so the members have actually quite a lot of power if they want it. And any member uh, can fill out one of these petition forms if they've not been nominated, they've, or if they've not been asked to be, uh, to be nominated, and they feel like they really want to be on the board. You can petition, all you have to do is get 10% uh, of the membership to sign it, and submit it to the board, and you are automatically on the ballot. So there's a, there's a way for anybody to be on the ballot if you really want to be. But our, our meetup membership member? Because that's like a thousand. Temper, no, it's 10% of the voting members. 10% of the voting members, so we have 90 voting members at the moment, so 90 people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so if you are interested in being on the board and you weren't asked, then there's still a pathway for you to get on the board if you really want, or to be at least on the ballot. So those petition forms come to uh, next gathering. And then in April, we actually have our election. So the election results. Um, are tabulated usually by the April gathering, um, if not coincident with it, um, or at least shortly thereafter. And then May, nothing happens. May is sort of a transition month because we know the results of the election, and the old board is working with the new board to hand over stuff that needs to get handed over. Then the new board takes office in June and uh, serves basically throughout the rest of the year, and then the next January this whole process begins again. It is a bit tedious. Um, but hey, that's democracy for you. I mean, we have to we have to make this work in order to make sure that we've got good people, and uh, and we get a good degree of turnover too. So here is the report from the nomination committee uh, that's been submitted to the board for executive director. Uh, this is for the next term. Uh, nominated are Melanie Clemmer and Alex Jules uh, for education director Jamie Carr and Tammy Walker. For social director, Chad Aldridge and Jeff Elmer. For outreach, Jeff Elmer again and Janelle Hill. For youth, uh, we only have one nominee, Elaine. So if you really want to be a youth director, here's the way to do it. Um, and for finance director, Jeff Elmer a third time. And he's a man of many talents. And Don Llewellyn. And then uh, we have a number of nominees just for the at-large positions. Um, Kevin Butler, Lisa Cloutier, Don DeNatale, Justin Fisher, Howard Hartness, Jason Hollis, and Dave Travis. So that is the that is not the final ballot. Again, that's the nomination committee's uh, recommendations and report. Um, if anybody else petitions the board, um, then the, the final ballot may look different. Um, and we don't need twenty five. <laughs> I just want to say we don't need twenty five thousand signatures. You only need them. Um, now, I did want to make one uh, point of distinction. So we also have, in addition to the board, we have officers. We have a chair, we have a secretary, and a treasurer. These are not necessarily the same as board positions, and these are actually not elected by the membership. These positions are elected by the board. The chair position, who the, the chair basically organizes and conducts the board meetings. That is the same definitionally as the executive director. So if you're elected the executive director, you become the chair. Secretary position um, basically takes notice of those all standard secretary stuff. Um, that is currently vacant. Howard is the acting secretary at the moment. And our treasurer is Georgine, stalwart. Georgine has <laughs> stuck with us for a long time. But we're actively looking for anybody who has uh, a modicum <laughs> of, of experience or interest um, to take over in that. Look good on your resume. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, so the question is, well, who can run? Who can actually run for the board? Any voting member. Any voting member can run for the board. That's the only qualification that you need. How do you become a voting member? Right? So you may not know this. Well, if you've been on our meetup page, and I'm guessing that most of us have, you see these, these gathering and potluck notifications. If you scroll to the bottom, you're going to see something that says, 
view the FOFD membership application. It's right there on our website. Every single time we have a public, that link is there. If you check in with Jeff at the front, you see a number of these membership applications. All you have to do is fill one of these out and get these into the secretary or, well, really anybody on the board who can get this, um, get you added to the roles. Speaking of adding people to the roles, we actually do have a number of uh, members that are member applications that we have to confirm. Alex uh, requested that I submit these to the membership. So unless there are any objections from the membership, we will confirm Clay and Jamie Houston, Betty Andre, Nick Travis, Chad Aldridge, and Alex Aguilar as voting members of the FOF. Now you have your kids in. Uh, no, that's, you know, we're still under that. Yeah, we're still under that. Um, so again, if you want your name read off, if you want to be added to the roles, if you want to be able to participate in this process, here are the voting application form, or voting member application forms. They're also online as PDFs, very easy to get and, um, and fill out. So, if you're not a voting member now, definitely think about it, and think about also 2014. So we're sort of you know, drawing, uh, drawing a bow around our current election process, um, and maybe, you know, this is a little bit soon for you to be thinking about it, but we need everybody to pitch in. And I mean everybody, and I mean you here in this room. If you've got it together enough to get up on a Sunday morning and your name is, then you have it enough, you have it together enough <laughs> to serve with the Fellowship for Free Thought. So, thank you very much. We have a number of board members that have asked for permission to come up and make announcements about um, things that we're, we're currently working on. And so I'd like to call up, um, I think Justin and Tammy are going to Thinking about the next topic that we'd like to, and, uh, we've settled on uh, philosophy of mind and cognitive science as the next topic. So we'll be talking about uh, such questions as what is the relation between the mind and the brain? How is consciousness possible? And we'll be talking about uh, uh, computer intelligence or intelligence and neural networks. Um, we'll be thinking about uh, visual perception. Um, we'll think about extended cognition, whether there are various cognitive peripherals perhaps someday uh, electronic implants into our brain, whether those can make us smarter. Um, we'll talk about cultural change and uh, 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 the evolution of language as well. So those are some of the topics we'll look at in there. Um, we're going to sort of model this along a course that I teach uh, called Mind Springs and Robotics. Um, the textbook uh, that we're going to use for this is a uh, nice little introductory textbook called Mindware by Andy Clark. Um, and, uh, the Amazon page, you can get a new starting at $25 on Amazon. You might be able to find it cheaper than that. Um, you might have noticed that I mentioned robotics in, in the class when I teach this class. One thing that's uh, pretty unusual about this as a philosophy class is that we have uh, the students uh, actually build Lego robots in the class. So I brought in one of our, our robots here. Um, and so we're thinking about uh, having philosophy club members do the same sorts of activities that we do um, with my students in the class. And so I'm going to show you a video of uh, uh, one of these activities. Let's see if it is to play. Okay, ready, set, go. Heard it in three seconds. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, your broom is working. Look at that, though. That's a Let's go take the angle out of here. And now I'm out of cards, so we just have to see whether we make it there. The goal here is to get to the end of the maze. Um, and the two robots. Oh, but this is actually my robot, the one that is going backwards now. <laughs> Three seconds, uh, 48. <laughs> 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 I think 
we just see a video of Vlad going, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there it is. Okay, now what's going to happen to me? Now I just need to stay inside of those without getting stuck on the island. <laughs> so then my robot goes around and the broom finally works to push the cards out of the way and so I stay stuck there and, and don't finish so my, my students outperform me on that one. So uh, good job to them. But anyway, uh, this activity is uh, the sort of final activity that we did where we uh, talked about some uh, game theory, evolutionary game theory stuff. And so this is set up as a sort of prisoner's dilemma where the uh, uh, robots can cooperate with one another or defect on one another, like spewing cards in their way, which, uh, which I failed to do successfully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, one of the activities that we do with this. Uh, we also do other activities uh, where we uh, are using a uh, uh, simple neural network to control the robot and activities where we're looking at different uh, understandings of the ways that perception work uh, to uh, uh, program the robot to navigate uh, the maze and using these optical sensors to detect the maze. Um, so this ends up being uh, quite a bit of uh, fun to do, um, and the students enjoy getting this sort of hands-on opportunity, and they're thinking that philosophy <coughs> club members might enjoy doing this sort of thing also. Um, so uh, the way we do philosophy club, but many of you have come before, but those of you who haven't, uh, we uh, meet uh, once a month. It's usually the first Saturday or the second Saturday, depending on what other events are going on of each month. We meet for three hours in the afternoon in Tammy's in my house. Um, uh, we, uh, if the number of people is large, we split into groups to encourage uh, conversation. Uh, if we have a small number, then we all just sit together around the round table. Um, especially for this topic, if we're going to be doing Lego robot activities, we'll try to do this kid friendly. So, uh, high school students who are interested. Um, younger kids who really like uh, Legos and uh, want to uh, take an interest in this sort of stuff, we'll, we'll try to keep the discussions uh, at a level that uh, other people could understand. Um, so one question you might be thinking well, is how much does this cost? Um, and this might be a barrier to some people. With, uh, I just looked up on Amazon today. Uh, the Lego has a newer version of this. Um, but uh, this is the version that I use in my class, and it works well, and I'm not sure it's worth spending the more money to get this like, new version. Um, but on Amazon, you can get this the lowest price they have is $250 for them. So with students, I usually have them in groups of uh, about three students working together on the robot. So if you wanted to, uh, to get a robotic kit, you could either get together with your family or together with some other people, pitch in together to get a robotics kit. Um, probably want to spend a little bit of extra money, you want to buy batteries for it, but it probably makes sense to do the chargeable batteries because that's more environmentally friendly. Um, and you may want to get uh, some electrician's tape and uh, white cardboard or uh, white chloroplast uh, to make it a maze to, to try out the robot, but uh, none of that stuff is very expensive, so the major cost would be doing this. Um, you can also get on eBay and see, here I found a used one on eBay that uh, I don't know whether they'll sell it or not, but they're asking $35 for it, which means you can get them cheaper that way, or there's also resale value if you don't break the robot, which uh, I haven't uh, had my students breaking in, um, in four years of doing this. So, uh, so if you decide you don't want the Lego robot kit afterwards, you can probably sell it on eBay for for at least a large fraction of what you paid for it. So, so it would only be a temporary cost if you want to get rid of it afterwards. So uh, I just wanted to let people know that this is on the radar. You might want to talk with your kids if they'd be interested in doing that. Um, and we haven't decided for certain we're going to do it with the robots part, rather than just reading and sitting around and talking about stuff. Um, so I'd like to hear feedback. So if people are interested in doing this with the robots, please uh, let me know that, that you'd want to be involved and that will help us to decide that, that we want to do it for robots. Or if you think that talking about the stuff sounds really neat but you don't want to do the whole robot thing, um, let us know that also. Um, so uh, good people to talk to are me or Jeff Allen or Alex here somewhere. Who knows with the kids? Uh, but we're both uh, involved with organizing this and Greg is also a good Okay, if that's uh, all I have to say about uh, that, so I Here's a robot. I think I'd be pretty excited to have that.
how small robots, but I don't know how excited our cats are going to be. Um, just really quickly, um, we do have a date set for the Feminist Spaces of Free Thought Conference. We're having monthly planning meetings, so if this is something that you're interested in, um, helping us shape the conversation that we're going to have at the conference, um, or if you're interested in things like social media, marketing, that sort of thing, uh, we would love to have you out. Our next planning meeting is March 3rd at 2.30 p.m. It's at uh, Just My House. And men and women are welcome to the planning committee, um, and men and will, women will be speaking at the conference as well. Um, we also have a Twitter feed, at Women of Reason, and we also have a secret Facebook group. Um, I'm not out to everybody on Facebook. I know a lot of people aren't, so we do have a Facebook group for Word, and if you want to join it, just let me know and I'll add you. Um, another couple of things that um, I'm doing, um, you can see I'm wearing an FOF button. Um, I have this available for a dollar donation, and we also have these awesome Women of Reason stickers. Great for cars, great for your laptops. Um, those are for a five dollar donation. And um, I know we just have Women of Reason, or Women of Reason I should say, but if there's interest in it, we'd be happy to print a Women of Reason ally. <laughs> Next up, we have our free thought kids who've been hanging out in the kitchen as a free thought. So we actually got to combine two classes today, the 5 to 8 year olds and the 9 to 12 year olds. And we were talking about the art that is in our bodies. And can anybody tell me what are the building blocks that make up our beautiful body? And uh, to okay, so so what we did because uh, my my specialty among uh, besides nutrition is crafts, and uh, besides teaching everybody to knit, what I decided to do is have everybody make uh, DNA friendship bracelets. And we only got about part of the way through, so everybody's bracelets are still taped in the kids' room. And so after they're uh, finished eating lunch, they can go back and finish their bracelets. And if any of the adults want to learn how to make them too, I've still got some, some more equipment, so, or more, more strings cut up. So, and I guess everybody's being dismissed to their parents. Um. Um, we're going to do something different with the kids being dismissed just to kind of take care of some, some of the congestion in the hallways. Is whenever we come in here at the end of the gathering, all kids are coming in here now and we're going to release some of the parents here now. So um, that way we don't have as much congestion to try and go get your kids and people in the food line and everything else. And also our teachers get out on time and everyone can't get their food. <laughs> That was a very important announcement to me. Okay, so everyone go find your parents. And of course, as we said before, um, we are always looking for more great educators to help with our kids. And if you're interested at all, we'll have kind of to talk to the manager to tell you where to go and, and what to do. Um, a volunteer application for that. All right, I do want to invite everybody to our next gathering. We are going to have Seth Andrews, the host of The Thinking Atheist. He will be here with copies of his book to um, have signed. He'll be presenting and he'll be signing in the three. He will not have a chance to stay for very long, so if you want to get a book signed or you want to have a chance to talk to him, you will need to arrive early because he's going to be going directly from us to Fort Worth at 1. So he's going to have to leave here at like noon exactly. But he will be here before 10.30. I've let him know that he needs to be here early if he wants to have some sit-down time. So if you want to come early for coffee and pastries with uh, Seth Andrews, you can get here a little early on the next time. And if you guys are new to our group, please remember not to throw away our plates. We do uh, reduce the cost and our impact on the environment. We reuse our plates. We also always need volunteers to help us take the plates and cups and various uh, silverwares home or greenwares in our case 
home and wash them. So you can let anybody with a board member tag on know, and we'll be happy to sign you up to, to take those dishes home and get them washed. Um, other than that, if you have any questions or comments or feedback, please write them down and tuck them in a, one of the donation boxes if you have money you would like to contribute. <coughs> yeah. Don has an announcement. Uh, just want to Jason and his staff here. Jason is coordinating uh, taking home the dirty dishes. We usually need three people each time. Usually somebody takes plates, somebody takes sips of work, somebody takes cups. There's one of three dishwashers, we'll bring that next time. If you don't talk to him, he'll come talk to you. Because we're looking for people to help with the dishes. Georgine also has to help. Um, if you made a donation in 2012 and you did not get your receipt or email, it's because I can read email address. So I have a bunch of letters up here at the front, and I'm only, my husband has um, something he has to do afterwards, so we won't be staying very long, but I'm here to give you a receipt if you don't already have it. All right, now, thank you all very much for attending, and let's go eat.